Good evening. Thank you all so much for helping us celebrate International Women's Day at Google. This is the first of many Women Tech Makers events that we hope to host. And actually, this is one of over 110 that we are uh, convening or, or helping to put on in the month of March. So this event is one of many, as you saw in the beginning. We have events today that happened in Boulder, Colorado, in the Philippines, um, in London, and New York. And so if you look at our hashtag, Women Tech Makers, you'll see a lot of different languages, voices, and perspectives because of this international community that we're bringing greater visibility to. And so the Women Tech Makers program has three pillars. And those three pillars, I think each one of them we built on today. And so of those, we have visibility, community, and resources. And so I think we really increased the visibility by, by seeing Pavni and, and Laura and all of these great women come up on stage and share their stories. We've created community together, I think especially during the Creative Skills for Innovation course, which I thought was fantastic. I love seeing all of your prototypes. And then resources. We've exchanged email addresses, and we've come up with greater ideas of what we can do to solve for the particular issues that we might see in the industry. And so I'm really excited for what's, what's to come. And so with this, I would love for you to check out our new website. We actually launched it sometime around 8 p.m. last night. <laughs> g.co slash women tech makers. I would love your feedback and your ideas. I want you to tell me what we're missing. I want you to tell me what I need to add, what you love. And, and if you want to be featured on an upcoming women tech makers show, if you want to contribute to our newsletter, I, I just want this to be something that we build together. Because women tech makers, it's, it's something for all of us. I really feel that the women tech makers program is is Google joining the already existing movement, standing on the shoulders of the people that have already laid the groundwork for supporting women in technology. And so this isn't just a Google initiative. This is an initiative for our entire community. And so with that, I want to offer you uh, the women-techmakers at google.com email address. It goes directly to me, and I will respond to every single email um, with, you know, in responding to feedback or ideas. Again, we are an open community. And, and we want you to be a part of building the future of women tech makers. So next, I, I want to share a little bit about a friend of mine, Megan Smith, who's about to get on stage. Megan Smith spearheaded women tech makers. Women tech makers is a program that would pop up around Google I.O., and that's our big developer conference that we hold at Google. And we sat down sometime middle of last year and decided that this should be a year-long global program. It, it really shouldn't be just something that pops up once a year. And so with that, we've created these pillars, we've created these opportunities, and I'm really proud of the work that Megan's doing for women, not, not just for women within Google, but outside of Google as well. And some of the work that she's done within Google is, as you'll see, she's a, a VP over at Google X. She's working on some of the most radical moonshots our company has ever thought of. And with that, she also leads Solve for X. I encourage you to go to solveforx.com, where we're thinking about and, and trying to find moonshot thinkers that are applying you know, breakthrough technologies to, to global issues and creating a radical solution. She also works at the Malala Fund, and, and that's just incredible in itself. She's really about empowering women inside of Google and great thinkers inside of Google as well as outside of Google. And so with that, Megan Smith. Hello. It's incredible to be here. It's incredible to see all of you because as we were thinking about women tech makers and imagining what it could be, a big part of that is, um, you know, we know that there's maybe about 16 million programmers in the world, and we know if we're 10 or 15 percent, that means there's at least two or three million of us. Uh, I'm actually a mechanical engineer, so I'm not a programmer, but I can program a little. Um, so I'm a little bit in. Uh, but that, where are we? Why can't we see ourselves? Why can't we be seen? And so visibility, as now said, is the first pillar. I want to talk today, I'm going to jump all around, um, but I really want to talk about heroic engineering um, and a little bit about the network and debugging inclusion in some interesting ways. And so I want to start with um, what I call the ground truth. Um, and I want to go to World War II. 
much of the computer industry that we are in, the modern computer industry, has its roots in World War II because people had to do heroic things. Um, and this is a picture from Bletchley Park. Um, what I love is a picture of Jean Valentine, who's a veteran uh, code breaker from uh, Bletchley Park. She also has a Googler who's a granddaughter. Or her granddaughter is a Googler, and so that's exciting. Um, but she was part of the, the bomb operators. And the ground truth for me is that technical women have always been in our industry. In fact, they're some of the founders. And so I, I think it's one of the things that we have to know, embrace, and start making visible. Um, not only Ada, who's awesome, and uh, Walter Isaacson is working on a book about the new digital, uh, the start of the digital age, and he's been in the Bodleian Library reading the um, Byron collection, reading Ada's paper. The stories are totally true, and uh, it's a very exciting thing. So starting with um, our, our code crackers, and, there's a story that I got to visit Bletchley, and I encourage you, if you're ever in London, take the train 45 minutes out of Paddington Station and go here. There were 10,000 people stationed at Station X, um, and uh, have, more than half of them were women. And they, they um, cracked the Enigma codes. And people credit this tech team with saving 11 million lives and shortening the war by like two years. Um, one of my favorite stories, I, I came into the main, main uh, house there, and I met this woman, this older woman, who is, is now retired and, and volunteers there. And she said um, she was five years old at Bletchley during the war. And she and her twin sister, her little brother and older brother, lived in the stables. And they were in this one section of the stables next door to Dilly Knox's team. And Dilly Knox was one of the astonishing mathematical leaders of Bletchley. And he led a team of women mathematicians. And she said to me, um, her mom used to always say, shh, the girls are working. Shh. The girls are working. And it just, it's like, I want that to be a Hollywood movie. And I want to know about those girls who were working and who saved all those lives and started our industry. Um, the second image that I want to show you is Charles Vest. This is President Chuck Vest. He, um, sadly, we lost him uh, in December. He was the 15th president of MIT. And I was, I'm on the MIT board. I was at a meeting yesterday and the day before. And we had a celebration of his life at MIT. One of the things that I knew about, but it was sort of vague to me, and I wanted to bring it back because it was just brought up, was um, that, that there was a moment when the MIT faculty, women, did an incredible watershed story. They took it upon themselves to look at lab space and science and all the unfairness that was going on on campus. And to Chuck's credit, when they came to him with the results of the study, actually in process, he kept encouraging them to do more. And then once they came with the data, he added a quote to the front of that paper that was really impactful in science. And he said, I have always believed that contemporary gender discrimination within universities is part of reality and part perception. Vest wrote in a much cited preface to the MIT report on gender equity. But I now understand that reality is by far the greater part of the balance. And it was so incredibly said that they got so many phone calls, outreach from across the world. Everybody wanted to act on this data and follow that leadership. So thinking about the ground truth of measuring problems and getting the word out about them is one of the fundamental things we can do in, in, you know, in the spirit of Chuck and those women who did that work. Um, and then uh, this slide is from this morning. I uh, started the morning with, uh, actually, with Little League uh, opening day with our boys. And then I came over to this mentorship walk run by Vital Voices. Do people know Vital Voices? Yes, no, a little bit. It was started by Hillary Clinton as a gathering, uh, just a little bit a ways after Beijing. But really, the, to start to highlight these astonishing women out there who are doing amazing work in their communities, I think of these guys almost as CAA uh, uh, for incredible entrepreneurial women around the world. And they find these rock stars, and they help them, almost like angel or venture investing into them. And Elise was on stage, and she said something interesting. She said, women, it's International Women's Day, and yes, you know, we need help from the world for women. But really, it's not that women need the world to help us. It's that the world needs women. We, they need us to step up and do the amazing things we already do and do them even more. And I want to flip into heroic engineering now, because that's what we all do. So this is a really cool uh, slide that one of our engineers, it's an image of one of our engineers hooked up the data centers to Google's traffic. And some people may have seen this before. But basically, the dots represent a certain amount of search traffic. And the red is English. You see some Spanish in the lighter green, yellow, and then the darker green with Portuguese, a little French over here in blue. But basically, to me, 
what this imagery represents, it happens to be Google traffic, but it's really about the internet. We are wired as a planet in a way that's really different from the past. And so that presents extraordinary opportunity. Um, and and uh, Clinton always says 21st century is really the age of creative collaboration. And look at what's going on. And just to kind of touch on the feeling of that, we had the Google Science Fair students actually here in this room, the 15 winners from around the world. And I was a science fair kid. I don't know if we have other science fair people out there. Yes. Uh, I went to the library and I got these books on solar energy and I looked at them and I did my project that way. These guys are on the web and they do breakthrough work. I mean, we did great work. They do breakthrough work. They're, they're advancing the field, the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, advancing the field, connecting, because they can do science at that level. It's a whole other magnitude uh, for science fair. This is um, thinking about the computer scientists. You guys are the most wired people in the world. These are computer science graduates at the University of Herat in Afghanistan, 80 miles from the Iran border. They're wired, they're starting companies, this is their startup center. You know, this is happening across the planet and it's exciting. Um, you know, just thinking about how data and point of view has become adjacent. Of course, there's Wikipedia, which I love. This is a, a tool called MapMaker that Lala put together uh, in Bangalore with the team. Most of the world doesn't have metadata for mapping, and it's been a challenge for our geo teams and OpenStreetMap and others. This is Lahore, Pakistan a couple years ago. You know, you would go on the map and look at an emerging country, and there'd be one line, and you know there was a million people there. So this is leveraging the diaspora and adjacency and the adjacency of data and knowledge to have the people of Lahore draw themselves onto the map. And so this is what we're seeing, you know, out of crowdsourced data. And in fact, astonishing activity on this tool. Mapping is so important because it helps with commerce, it helps with ambulance deliveries, it helps with city planning. We need this data. People help themselves, and data that was adjacent comes together. Um, Sal Khan, people know Sal, yes? Uh, the Khan Academy. This is a really old screenshot, but I love it because the density of it is so incredible. This one guy teaching all these classes. And it's not to say that one person should really teach all classes, but, uh, but I think it, it's this moment of somebody stepping up in a heroic way and saying, we need to change education. I have an idea. Let me just start. And it shows the cracks in the dam in the beginning of the change of education. These are CS for high school, uh, awesome computer science high school teachers who are now collaborating. We flash mobbed them together into a physical um, weekend a couple years ago. Now hundreds of them are collaborating on the web to fix the curriculums. Master teachers are going to fix the schools, not people sort of putting down teachers. Um, first Robotics. Do we have First Robotics people? Yes? No? Yes. Um, nationals. Like, shouldn't school feel like Friday Night Lights? Um, this is an amazing, this is the Nationals in St. Louis. Um, this is in our son's uh, third grade school uh, classroom, very hands-on. And what I love is this idea that education could really teach children that in effort, there's joy. And in working with Malala, we talk a lot about um, what does it mean to have a quality education? Is it just like this content? Because we know that a lot of very smart people have done some pretty awful stuff, some very educated people. So what does it mean to have ethics and effort and you know, be included and, and be in the 21st century? So thinking about the web that way and how we work together. This is a, an experiment in Ethiopia where people have um, tablets, and they've gone to a village um, where no one can read within 10 miles. And the experiment is, could the kids teach themselves if they have the same apps that we're giving our kids? Could they just start collaborating and do that? And in fact, in the first week, they used 50 apps. And they're so close to reading. It's incredibly exciting. And I put them near last year's Science Fair winners because the two guys there are from Swaziland. And I think very soon, these kids will be these kids if we just get them the content and get them each other and get them the master teachers networked. Um, so go to the next. Uh, Network data to get us out of climate change information, not only the en engineering we need to do, but the information technology work that we need to do. This is Earth Engine. Um, I got to work on the beginning of book search. And I would have never thought of this application. You know, we're scanning all the books, working with the publishers, working with the libraries, and engaging that way. This is a tool, the New York Times published this particular data, but all the words that were ever written are now adjacent. And that's a data set that's very interesting to traverse across. This is someone doing analysis that the New York Times published on the word women. The word women is not used very much in books in English from 1800s to 2008 until the modern women's rights movement started. What can we learn about ourselves by reflecting the data back to ourselves? So this is the network I showed you. But when the globe spins around, there's still many places where the network is not. 
This is a serious problem. Uh, lots of talent is not included. 900 million people in Africa are not in the global conversation. It was so exciting to me to see the Oscars, because in the main shots, every time when Ellen was like running around with pizza, um, you, would, you would see people who were from Africa finally in the mix, finally collaborating with us. That's awesome. Um, the truth is that as of 2005, this is actually the network map for this continent. There was no cable. That lightweight pink means planned. No cable next to a continent. I'm not sure what the World Bank was doing. And then over here, it's missing you know, a whole bunch of countries. So this is a super huge failing of the development world and uh, you know, the people doing that work. The good news is it looks like this now. And I think one of the greatest changes we will see in the world is as our colleagues from Africa join us. And so uh, this is an, an image of I hope Nairobi. You could be south of market. You could be in Silicon Alley. Um, David Senge is a PhD student at MIT, wrote a great blog about Aid to Africa Becomes Made in Africa, the Fab Lab movement my, live and well. This is what the actual network is looking like right now globally, so a lot of gray. We got to fill in. We're doing crazy projects at Google X, like Project Loon, um, using balloons as an intermediary uh, to try to get the web to places. Um, we have this idea of moonshots. So a moonshot being, you know, like the original moonshot, what's a huge problem or opportunity in the world? Is there some technology that sounds like science fiction, but we could, we could bring it to bear on some kind of radical solution for solving that problem? Uh, there have been moonshot pioneers. We're doing it at X, but I wanted to call out one of my favorites, which is George Washington Carver, who, uh, when he went from Missouri, when he was invited by Booker T. Washington to go to Tuskegee in Alabama and join the faculty, he saw the problem of uh, the monocrop culture of the US and the malnutrition and the problems that we had of not understanding crop rotation and the future of how agriculture had to be. And he went into the lab as a heroic scientist as a heroic engineer. And he works through all kinds of ideas for sweet potatoes and, and uh, peanuts and the stories went on. And then he figured out how to radically get it out there using Jessup wagons. And he changed our country. So Google X, just a quick touch on it. People think it's like this, we have a lot of hype. But the truth is, it's really a skunk works kind of place, really messy, really fun. The slight difference between maybe other parts of Google is there were a lot of hardware. That's where the big difference is. So we're looking for people who are optics engineers and robotics and, and uh, you know, bio and other, the, these other disciplines that Google hasn't classically had. You know, desks look like this. Um, our goal is to do these moonshots. And uh, culture, we want to feel like Willy Wonka. It's got to be fun, interesting, collaborative, unusual. Uh, Isabella, who um, we were doing a video, and she's the designer of Glass. She's like, why well, didn't feel odd coming to Google X? Because kind of everybody's odd. And I thought, that's good. Uh, but this idea of Peter and Petra Pan surrounded by awesome teams. So Solve for X is the thing that I'm actually personally most passionate about at X, which is, could we make a platform to help all these amazing moonshot pioneers out in the world be more visible? We often celebrate what people finished in our sort of science history books. Um, we celebrate you know, the success. But could we help people in process? You know, Elon Musk, 2008, when everyone thought he was insane. You know, why is he buying that factory? His rockets are blowing up. Look at SpaceX now. Look at Tesla now. So how can we celebrate people when they're in process? Um, and the other thing I do a lot of is we make sure that people from uh, all different continents, people of different races, men and women, people of different age groups are really celebrated on the site so people can see. You can't see what you can't. You can't be what you can't see. So I'm going to flip it to the, this last part, which is about um, debugging inclusion. And so networks are incredible places to do our heroic engineering, to change commerce, et cetera. I'm from Buffalo, so in addition to the Silk Road, which is such an incredible example of a network that changed the world, I added the Erie Canal. Um, the Erie Canal is interesting for the US development because it dropped the grain price by a factor of 10 to get goods in and out of the country. It really changed the game from a commerce perspective. But it also is the place where most of the, the major abolition and, and suffrage conversations happen. And in fact, Seneca Falls is right here on one, with one of the locks. And how many people know about the Declaration of Sentiments? Yeah, it's so interesting to me. So the Declaration of Sentiments is the watershed 
uh, document around women's rights. It's the first women's rights convention. I can't believe in around visibility that's not taught in all of our schools in elementary school. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote this document. You should read it. It has 15 sentiments. Uh, many of them are true in some countries still. Um, it's the watershed moment for us uh, in, in beginning of women's rights. Um, I feel like we're making huge progress, right? Uh, it, it, we've, we've, we stand on the shoulders of giants from Elizabeth to people like Catherine Switzer, who had her numbers ripped off in the Boston Marathon, a moment of extreme violence in the Boston Marathon from the, four, from the 70s. Um, the guy didn't want her in the race. But she finished that race. And I, I encourage you to watch the makers videos, which have her story and others. Uh, we did makers at Google videos, by the way, of Pavni and others, if you want to see some of their stories. But really, getting the stories told, the work that Cheryl's doing, the work that's happening at the UN, I feel like we're making progress. But in tech, we still have to work on our visibility. I, I did a, a panel session on STEAM and STEM at the Makers Conference, and Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space, um, said, you know, technical women have an issue because we're a minority in tech and we're often unseen. And women have been kind of convinced not to follow math and science. They're sometimes afraid of it. And so we're a minority amongst women, and they sometimes don't include us. And so we're totally invisible. And so I think we, the technical women, need to show up and we need to have conversations with our colleagues so that they're not afraid of what we're doing. We need to include them and get them excited about what we're doing, because it's really the way that we're going to solve a lot of problems. And I won't go into all the details here, but you see the Bletchley Park folks, uh, the ENIAC, which is the first US digital computer, um, World War II, University of Pennsylvania, first programmers were women. Um, their stories haven't been told. Of course, Grace Hopper, Katherine Johnson, uh, African-American woman, now 96, calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission. We need to know about her. She's awesome. Her job was to be a computer. She wrote 26 papers. She was part of author 26 papers at NASA. Her name's only on one. Hedy Lamarr, et cetera, the Apollo women. Who saw the movie Jobs? Yeah. Do you remember the Macintosh scene? So Steve Ashton walks in. He did a good job, I thought. Uh, walks in, and there's these guys hanging out in the Skunks Works project called the Mac. Burl Smith is kind of asleep on a desk and wakes up. Burl is uh, um, the guy on the far side here. He's got the keyboard here. Um, Bill Atkinson is in the middle, starts engaging the actor uh, of Jobs, Ashton. He's, he has the Mac shirt here. He's in the middle there. Um, some of the other guys on the side are in the scene. Andy Hertzfeld is the, is the guy who actually works at Google now. He's amazing. Worked with him at General Magic. There's a scene where Steve Jobs goes and finds this engineer who's a rock star. He's, he's coding. He has a conversation. Andy says he'll join the Mac in two days. Steve says, OK, and then unplugs his computer, picks up the computer, and brings it uh, to the team in that moment. True story. So Andy's there. Are there some people on the screen that are not in the movie? This is the Rolling Stone historic photos of the original Mac team documenting the team that created the Mac. Who's missing? All of them. So in this picture, there's seven men, four women, and a baby. This is uh, Joanna Hoffman. She graduated in physics from MIT, and she was the product manager of the Mac, Steve's right-hand person, kind of like Sala or Susan for us, like amazing. Susan Kerr. So what was so cool about the Mac was its graphics, right? And so Bill Atkinson wrote the back end. Susan did the front end. Everything you saw was Susan. Why did Hollywood write them out? I don't know. Um, but the good news is we're working on this stuff. The documentary about the ENIAC programmers is just completed. It's going to go through the film festival circuit. It's awesome, and the stories are true. Um, a wonderful. Uh, uh, I can lawyer um, interviewed four of the six of them before they died, and so we have that record, so we can resurrect this lost history. Um, and then in terms of Gina Davis and, and Hollywood, Gina's been measuring the lack of, of women and girls in children's television and the lack of you know, women, like 80% of the jobs in children's television held by male characters. And so we're starting to use CS to help make her tools more real time. So lots of good stuff there. Um, the founding of Women Tech Makers, which we invite all of you to become collaborators on this. It's really about visibility and community and resources. Um, we started with Google I.O. because it's the place where we reach out to the most developers. That was our strategy there. We're doing a lot of stuff around trying to debug this. We don't know the answers how to fix these problems. 
we've inherited the weight of history. None of us created the bias that exists in the world for women and minorities, but we can work to fix it. One of them is doing unconscious bias training on all of Google. It's really helping us. I think the biggest breakthrough is in the Doodle team, which was receptive, but we really, as a company, would have never meant to not celebrate a woman's birthday in the Doodles, and we did that for seven years. We never celebrated a woman's birthday. And then we realized, people pointed out, we started to dig, and history's biased. We only do doodles about people who are not alive. So we weren't finding them and celebrating them. So they started to get to 20 30%. This year, after doing bias training and the way the world has changed, as of January 1, they're at 50 50. And you can see it. It's changing. So I'll end uh, with two slides. First, this one, which is remember, the girls are working. And they always have been. And they always will be. And then I think one of the secrets is I was really lucky to get taught acoustics by Professor Bose, who we lost last year. And one of the things that he would do as a professor, he'd also give us advice. And one of the greatest pieces of advice he gave us was, you guys are high performing people. You know, you're doing your stuff. But figure out what you love to do. What are you passionate about? And do that. Because you will be unstoppable if you do that. And so I just encourage you, the diversity of all of the millions of us, the technical women, the computer science women, is broad. This industry and this planet needs us badly. So bring what you want to do, what you want to discover, what you want to make. Raise your voice, raise your visibility, and uh, find your ex, and find your team. And let's network and, and make it happen. So thank you. So these guys said that we were going to do one or two questions, and then we're around. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yes, no, then. Yeah. Can I just say thank you? That was awesome and so inspiring and really made this day worth it. Thanks. Thanks. Good comment. Yay. Just uh, along those lines, um, one of my strategies when Natalie and we all were brainstorming about women tech makers was, uh, um, we are the ones we've been waiting for, is that Alice Walker book. And just take, own it. And I, sometimes I call it bring it. Instead of yet another panel about why there's not enough women and minorities and tech, it's so boring, right? And it doesn't engage anyone and it doesn't capture their imagination. And so instead, if they can see you and what you are doing, it will change the way they think. And then we can also add in the problems and start to debug them and work on them, but bring it. And so as we do this stuff, that's one of my thoughts on that. Any other quick questions? It's been a long day. There's some over here. Um, how do you see the challenges that women face in tech is unique from the challenges women might face in other industries where they're also minorities, or we're also minorities? Um, I think it's a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, Everybody is facing unconscious bias. The guys and we, the women, we, none of us created it, as I said. It's, it's, you know, the doodle team is such a good example because Ryan and the team would have never done, we just wouldn't have done it, but when they wake up, it changes things. So I think you have to bring the data um, because I, I really think our industry doesn't think we have a problem. They, we're such a data-driven industry that we think we're such a meritocracy. And we are in a lot of ways. It's one of the greatest things about Tech. In fact, um, my friend Tom Riley, I ran an internet company called Planet Out in the gay community, and Tom Riley, uh, who founded Planet Out, there was a guy named Michelangelo Signorelli, and he was talking about the gay community in the closet, and he wrote a book about um, media industry in, in New York in the intense closet there. This was sort of in the 80s and 90s, um, and, and as, the, as the AIDS crisis was happening. The intense closet of the government in DC, and the intense closet and oppression of the go of, in uh, Hollywood in LA, and he added a chapter called The Silicon Solution. And it was really about how, to, how we are a meritocracy in tech and how we think that way. So I do think that we actually have the greatest opportunity because of that to change the fastest. But I think that, I really think people aren't, I think there's two issues. We noticed one issue in our company. People really aren't convinced that we have a problem. And so they need to understand that. They need the Chuck Vests and other people. Larry gave us a company-wide OKR to try to become the best company for women and minorities. So now everybody has to like, think about, what does that mean? What do I need to do? You know, opens the innovation space. So get people convinced, use data, use whatever it takes. Um, and then I think there's also people outsource it to the diversity team. Every company has a diversity team 
who are incredible people. But how many of them are there? Maybe 30 maximum on any company. And so you can't outsource them. You have to use them. You have to do it yourself as a manager and use them as your awesome experts to help you do it better. And so we need to get the companies to start doing that, and we need to have those conversations with the HR uh, folks and really get innovative. We do not know how to solve this problem. So we should recognize that and go at it as an industry. Um, and really, back to the way Elon Musk thinks, which is what's the fundamental physics for doing this so it could be possible? And so what's the fundamental fix of physics? What's the data that's preventing us? What's this very complex stuff? So that's, I think, how the sort of overall strategy of how we should approach it. Yeah. Hello. Um, I also want to say thank you so, so, so much. And um, I brought my daughter here today. Yay. She's Hello. 12. <laughs> and um, we live in o Emeryville, Oakland border. And um, the statistics and experiences for black and brown girls in Oakland, South Africa, Los Angeles, New York are pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know if you had one piece of advice that you would give to black and brown girls um, about getting into tech and using tech as a tool for liberation, empowerment, mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them or her? Yeah, so um, a couple things. One of the things that I want you to know is about the woman that I was talking about, like Katherine Johnson, the woman who calculated the trajectories for the Apollo missions and stuff, that African American women have been part of fundamental inventions for the whole time. But for some weird reason, people have written them out of history or down in history. So let's bring that back so that the kids can see that. That's important for the boys and the girls to see. It's important for everybody to see. She has one of the 300 flags from the Apollo mission. She is in the elite Apollo team. We need to know that she was there. Um, same thing, actually, just in general about the astronauts. So it's this sort of weight of history. Let's bring the true history forward and know it um, and own it. Uh, even if they weren't the majority of the team, they're in the team, and they're contributing at elite levels, sometimes founders. Um, I think the second thing is uh, we've been doing some studies about um, women and just kids getting into tech. And one of the key ones is encouragement. So just being here is going to help you. It's going to help people. Um, all of you, anything you can do, it turns out the encouragement doesn't have to come from a technical person. It just has to come. Um, one of the sad statistics that we've come across with and we're working on is that 70% of the computer science high school teachers think that the boys are better than the girls despite overwhelming evidence. And so you know the stereotypes that they've had and the boring way that we teach are playing out that the programmer video game kids are getting through and the other kids who wouldn't. And Harvey Mudd has done an astonishing job of changing their curriculum in order to attract different everybody. And they're at 50-50 men and women. They have a lot more minorities. They have a lot more people. They've grown the field because they changed it from, they changed it to creative problem solving. Who doesn't want to be creative and solve problems? And they don't walk in and start with math. They walk in and they start with problems and impact. Because it turned out that a whole set of people just want to change the world. And they don't love science and math because it hasn't been taught in a way that's accessible. S accessible. So they do things like go to Congress. They do things like start nonprofits. They do amazing things. But they don't include tech. And so those are some of the weakest tech areas, uh, sectors. You know, look at what happened with the health website. You know, and look what happens in development and the NGOs. They're not technical because people are afraid of technology because we taught it wrong. So I think wherever you can, touch the field. You know, do science first so you see that science isn't the history and the way they're teaching, but it's actually doing it. It's what we do that's awesome. And uh, the, other, the other breakthrough that University of Maryland has, which is um, actually the university that we find the most African-American software engineers for Google, is uh, how fast can you have a student be in the field? Because they have so many stereotypes. I mean, you watch uh, the Big Bang Theory. Like, do you really want to work with those people? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> And so they think it's not like it is. And people think it's lonely, and they think it's solitary, and it's not in any way. And so we need to kind of have Hollywood help us and get the information through and get the kids to our field to do those things. So there's a couple uh, things I'd recommend. Come on. So we want to get you guys uh, to the reception. So, um, so I had a small group of us had this idea, and it's so exciting to see what Natalie and Kyle and everybody have done to take it to level. And we want to give it to you guys, women tech makers, and you know, let's go bring it. 
So thank you for being here.